Welcome, thank you for joining us. Thank you for this uh, last round of session today and for your interest in the topic uh, of this panel discussion. Um, very glad that you all made it uh, to, the, to the end of the day. Um, this session is about the online experience of groups and communities that face um, discrimination and, uh, in our societies. Um, and in the framework of this Privacy Camp edition on technology and activism, it was quite important for us to highlight how technology and especially the internet um, supported the creation and organization of social movements, of so many social movements um, online um, that actually fought and still are fighting against societal oppression. Um, and that's the case for so many discriminated groups for which the internet has been a, a really great empowerment tool. Um, but unfortunately, the internet also is also an extension of the offline world, and so it enables a lot of further discrimination and further forms of violence. Um, so this is why it's essential to really understand how power relations function online um, and how this impact and slow down the work of activists um, in, in organizing their cause uh, online um, and how they organize online and how they try to further their cause. Um, for that purpose, I'm super pleased and super grateful um, to have with me four representatives of those groups. Um, we have first uh, Pamela Morinière, who is uh, head of communication and campaigns, as well as gender officer at the International Federation of Journalists. Thank you for being here. Uh, we have Stefan Balog from Romea, which is an organization based in Czech Republic, working with uh, Roma people and defending their rights. Thank you for making the trip. Um, we have then Alejandro Mol Moledo, which is, uh, who is a policy coordinator at European Disability Forum, based here in Brussels. And lastly, we also have Umaima Amidi from the Rainbow House in Brussels. So it's an LGBTQI uh, plus center um, working um, at the local level here in Brussels. Um, so welcome. Um, I thank them already to uh, be there to, for accepting to share their insights with us um, and maybe going out of their comfort zone, talking to a different kind of crowd. Um, so for that, um, I would ask the public and the audience to be welcoming with them. We all want kind of an inclusive and respectful debate and exchange today. So um, please be welcoming and make sure that they feel at ease and that they eventually come back to us. Um, that being said, I would like to say a couple more words of, on the political context of this discussion. So why are we having this discussion today? Um, and then we'll, we'll try to structure the discussion this way. Um, I will try to set with the panelists, and the panelists will do this, set the debate, set the discussion, and try to map the different kind of violence that are taking place online. And then we'll try and turn to the public and have a discussion about potential solutions we can uh, think of. Um, so as for the context, um, the starting European mandate will actually try to look at regulating platforms uh, online um, and notably reopen um, the rules of the old e-commerce directive, which was adopted in the 2000s. Um, and this rules had a huge impact on how platforms are hosting intermediaries, as we call them, um, how they moderate content online. Um, and those rules might be uh, reformed and re-edited. Um, the text for now is called the Digital Services Act. And some people actually try to frame it as the next hate speech law. So it's quite interesting. And um, this doesn't really come out of nowhere because there were already several initiatives in the past um, at European level, but also at national level um, to combat hate speech, to combat harmful content online. So for us as digital freedoms advocate, it will be like the huge next big legislative battle. And we will try to defend our vision of freedom of expression online. But of course, we need to remain really cautious and, and conscious um, of the various injustices, the forms of discrimination that are taking place, and try to integrate them into our position. 
And this is why it's so important that we consult different communities um, uh, who do not un enjoy the same um, social privileges as we have, like being white, being male, being uh, heterosexual and cisgender, being able-bodied, um, yeah, and benefiting from a super higher education. So thank you, we'll start the discussion now. Um, I want to start with uh, turning myself to Pamela. Um, how, what, what kind of forms of violence do female journalists especially experience online? Um, because now it's, it's kind of inevitable for a journalist not to use social media, but has a, had a lot of impact on their work and especially kind of the environment, which can be sometimes violent, um, have on their work. How can they, uh, what, what do they face uh, regularly on their daily basis? Do you have examples? Uh, first of all, thanks for, for inviting me. Um, and, and I would just like to make that comment. Uh, we don't consider ourselves as a minority. Uh, women uh, journalists make almost uh, now half of the journalism population. Um, so um, that's not the way we, we, we see women journalists. Um, but it's true that the issue of online harassment is, is something that is, uh, has raised a lot of concerns in our organization. We represent journalists, trade unions around the world. Um, we represent about 600,000 journalists. Um, it has been, um, we've been running several campaigns actually on this issue in the past five years. It's not a new issue at all for us, we, uh, and, I and I will share some examples with you, but it's, uh, uh, the online harassment has been going on uh, for a long time. I think that the only difference now is that uh, journalists consider that it is not part of the job anymore. And I think for many years, it's just been like, okay, we, are, we, we speak publicly, we get our stories uh, in, in the public, it's fair enough that we get a bit of abuse. But actually, the amount of abuse that especially women journalists get uh, goes far beyond what, is, what should be acceptable in, uh, in the workplace. Um, we are an organization that, that, uh, that promotes uh, promote press freedom, so I feel also quite comfortable here because I, I think we share lots of values uh, with people in this room and, and outside this room. Um, and that's why also the issue of social media is very dear to us because we want to prevent abuse, but at the same time we want to allow people to be able to, to communicate and to express themselves. Um, we publish every year um, a big report that uh, uh, counts the number of journalists that, that have been killed around the, around the globe. Uh, 49 uh, journalists have been killed last year, for example. And uh, what we found out is that uh, most of these journalists had received threats before they got killed. Threats that have not been taken into account. Uh, by governments, but also by media houses. And this is why it's so important for us that we take this online uh, violence seriously. Um, we have uh, published a first, um, a first survey on this issue in uh, 2017 be because we wanted to document the extent of violence that women get because it's true that they get more abuse than men online, and at least it's a different type of abuse. It's a gendered abuse. It's often uh, sexually connoted, um, and it has a lot of links to the way society is, unfortunately. Um, and we found out that 43% of journalists, of women journalists in the world, faced online abuse, which is, uh, which is almost half of the working force, which is uh, scandalous. Um, and so we've tried to, um, to respond to that, and, I, uh, and I'll come back to that later, but we put many things in place in order to, to respond. And just maybe uh, what is uh, concretely how it happens. Um, uh, online abuse takes two forms, at least for, for, for journalists. It's first the uh, online impersonation, uh, meaning you set up a, a Facebook account, a Twitter account on behalf of someone else and you pretend to be this person and send uh, uh, out of place comments. And the second one, which is probably the most used, is uh, online threats, threats of rapes, uh, sexist comments, um, downgrading comments, uh, that's the, the usual uh, type of thing. 
Uh, and to give you a concrete example, uh, there's a famous journalist who is called uh, Khadija Ismaeva that some of you may know who's an Azeri journalist, and it was already back in uh, 2000, uh, 2012 that she, goes, she got abused online because people wanted to prevent her from uh, revealing uh, lots of cases of corruption. She's a very well-known, very well-respected um, investigation journalist. And uh, people, uh, some people threatened to publish uh, online um, a video of her and her partner having uh, sex. And uh, they said, well, we're going to publish it unless you, you stop writing. And she said, I will never stop writing. And they published uh, that video, and it went completely viral. And this journalist has spent then several years in jail. Uh, this is just to give you an, a concrete example also of uh, uh, the, quali the, the, the bravery of uh, some, some of these women journalists. Lots of them cannot cope with it, but some of them also cope with it and continue writing despite these threats that are um, very hard to take. Yeah, that's definitely a, a big challenge to just claim the space. It deserves a lot of courage that not all of us have. Um, I would like to turn to Umeima. Um, um, could you please briefly maybe explain to our crowd, which is an international crowd, um, what is the work of the Rainbow House in Brussels? Um, and how does it interlink with um, today's topic? Like, how, what is your use of social media? Um, and how do, do your activists or your members um, d uh, use social media to, to organize and to uh, plan activities? Thank you. Uh, I want also thank uh, Edri for the invitation. So I work for Rainbow House Brussels. It's the umbrella of the LGBTQI plus association in Brussels. We have actually uh, 64 uh, LGBT organization in Brussels and we are the umbrella. Uh, our work is very large. We are a political lobby at regional and national level. At the European level, we are working with ILGA. We have uh, various uh, mission. Uh, we organize, we are very active in culture with the three big festivals in Brussels, also at school, in education. Uh, uh, so we are very present in different uh, sector. So uh, social media, that was the question. Social uh, media are uh, actually essential in our job. Uh, we used to work with uh, yes, uh, famous uh, platform like Facebook, Instagram, uh, internet in generally because uh, in Belgium the user of um, Facebook uh, count uh, six uh, million more than six million people so it's uh, a huge uh, numbers um, and our community I think uh, have also a special uh, like relation with the social media because uh, it seems like very accessible to everyone. We know there are a lot of problems, but uh, the LGBT community are organized through the social uh, network, uh, so social media. The problem, if I can speak about the violence, c'était déjà dans la question? Okay, because uh, LGBT community also are exposed to many violence, even uh, like, like women. Uh, there are also double discrimination. If you are a lesbian woman, you are also victim of homophobia and sexism. But LGBT community has uh, really uh, specific attacks and violence, like uh, black blackmail, uh, blackmail uh, from the authority or from the users, other users. I think, for example, of the application uh, Grinder. Everyone maybe know Grinder. It's an uh, application to meet other gay men. Um, so in uh, countries outside uh, Europe, like Tunisia, for example, the police use Grinder. They created fake uh, accounts to catch uh, gay men. This is very common. Uh, but in Europe, we have also a big problem with this app. 
uh, and also in uh, the United States. For example, in United States, the Grinder uh, sell, il a vendu, sell, by uh, the information, the data uh, of the users to two big companies. Uh, in France, of in Belgium, the users uh, use like homophobic users of bad people use this app to take money to attack uh, the gay men, and the authority is not uh, yes it's, it's not responding uh, seriously to this uh, big problem. And uh, blackmail, yes, uh, maybe people from, from Holland uh, heard about uh, this uh, young YouTubers uh, of, uh, woman uh, who uh, was a victim of blackmail. Blackmail with the outing, like, the, you know the word out, to be out is, so this is also very common. People use the story of trans people, lesbian people, to say, okay, you have a YouTuber, but if you don't sell. So this is very common. And we have also waves of discrimination uh, when uh, you have like controversial uh, topics. I think France, for example, uh, when there was the Eurovision, uh, with the Bilal Hassani, who was representing France, uh, we we see like uh, we saw a big wave of homophobia, racism, xenophobia, and of course the user, the LGBT user, are exposed to this uh, discrimination. So, a lot of uh, things that take a lot of different forms and even even if you're not, I feel like even if you're not vocal you just try to use the services at hand you, you can still be like attacked for who you are um, and and feel uncomfortable in those space because you're not welcome um, because other people get the attack and you feel like you're you're shutting yourself down um, turning to uh, people with disabilities um, um, Alejandro, what are the, what what? How do people with disabilities use the internet, and how um, is um, people getting uh, abused online? Um, could you please kind of share your examples of kind of online abuse that target uh, people with disabilities? Thank you very much, and I also second the thank to Edri for inviting to, to share our experience. Well, uh, first of all, I'd like to, to, to mention that persons with disabilities are early adopters of technologies, of new technologies, and actually um, many innovation when it comes to, to technologies, technologies such as, for instance, the TV remote control came, came up because of trying to overcome a disability challenge. And you may think of like the first, the very first um, act of discrimination towards persons with disabilities when it comes to these uh, communication platforms or any um, piece or uh, piece of technology or, or, or um, technology, technology service is the lack of accessibility. I mean, persons with disabilities, they are early adopters of technologies when these are available affordable and accessible to them. So the very first uh, act of discrimination that we found many times in our everyday life is the lack of accessibility when you want to use a computer, when you want to use a smartphone, or when you, when you want to use a, a website. And people with disabilities tend to use technologies on a greater extent than their uh, non-disabled peers because with technologies, if these are accessible, of course, you can overcome many barriers that you encounter, uh, physical barriers that you encounter in your, in your everyday life. And this is why, um, uh, this is, uh, I always like to, to mention this, the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, which has been ratified by the EU as a regional organization and by all member states, so it belongs to the legal framework of, um, of the EU, um, does recognize accessibility to new technologies and the internet as a, as a right that needs to be protected and promoted by, by the third parties. And this is what, from EDF, we've been advocating for. Um, 
uh, ensuring that, uh, and we'll do the same along with EDRI for the Digital Services Act, to ensure that all the proposals put forward by the, by the EU do actually incorporate accessibility as a prerequisite. And having said that, then obviously uh, persons with disabilities do also suffer um, in cases of either um, misleading uh, portrait or discriminatory portraits of disability uh, to hate speech, to um, harassment and, and cyberbullying. We've seen many cases, um, and there is the, 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 the most uh, recent and, and famous one has been the, the case of Greta Thunberg, the, the activist, uh, who was uh, accused of being instrumentalized by her parents because of her um, autism. She revered the, 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 the attacks and said that this was her superpower. But persons with disabilities face this kind of uh, portraits uh, on an everyday basis. And needless to say, if you are a person with a disability, if you're a woman with disability, and women with disabilities suffer like uh, uh, six out of 10 women with disabilities suffer any, uh, suffer um, forms of uh, abuse um, throughout their lives. And, is even greater when it comes to people with intellectual disabilities. In those cases, I would recommend you to, to take a look at uh, a report from, a, from one of our members, Inclusion Europe, which is the organization representing uh, people with intellectual disabilities, um, in which they gather cases uh, of uh, harassment, of, uh, of bullying, of um, threats as well, blackmailing, persons with, with intellectual disabilities. And maybe we'll, we'll, throughout the debate, we can go into, into more details about, about this. One of you can share. <laughs> no problem. I hope you're going to have enough time to share more. Um, the reality of Roma people, it's, it's another one. It's completely different um, because um, maybe not everyone knows what does it what does it actually entail? Um, can you explain just uh, very shortly, um, I know it's hard because it takes multi-forms, but what is anti-gypsism? Why, why do we call it like this? Um, and what form does it take online? Uh, so Roma and Sinti uh, people have been living in Europe more than 600 years, and their discrimination and their political persecution uh, has been happening uh, for just as long. Roma people usually um, are described by the so society as uh, people who don't work, who uh, don't send the children to the school, who uh, are who doing uh, criminal activities. So uh, through the online world and also uh, the normal world, non-online non world, um, it's, uh, it's about uh, the hate against Roma people. So usually when, when there's a, for example, a school uh, and there's a class in that school, there are three Roma children. Uh, the non-Roma children uh, don't want to sit next to them just because their parents told them that the Roma people are not the same as them. So, um, or for example, when the Roma, uh, people goes to the hospital, uh, the doctors and the, the staff in the hospital treat them differently than the non-Roma people. Uh, I think uh, in the past decade, uh, the hate uh, against Roma people spread very quickly just because of the social media like Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, and all the other uh, social medias. Um, when the Roma people are presented in the uh, main medias in the positive ways, it's usually when it's something uh, abnormal or it's a sensation. For example, uh, there were women who gave birth to uh, uh, quintuplets, and it happens that the, the woman uh, is a Roma woman. And it was the first quintuplets in Czech Republic, so they are treating the, them um, very good, but on the other side, most of the uh, most of the society treat them good. But on the other side, there were also people who were like 
they will get a social welfare system, uh, they, will, uh, they will get a presence from the donors. So it's like, um, I think, uh, it's my opinion, that there's uh, uh, many, many um, ways to, to describe the anti-Gypsism, but for me it's like hate on the Roma people in general way. Uh, it happens online, it happens in the streets, it happens whenever you go, uh, there is someone in the in the population who has something against Roma people, yeah. Uh, usually, um, when when you're talking with someone about Roma, uh, the people say that Roma can only dance, sing, and play instruments. No one, n nothing else can do. Yeah. Yeah. So it's like in a, a very deep discrimination, feelings, stereotypes being attached to this. Um, I just want to further discussion on this. Like, do you have kind of like example or how does it like this online violence that Roma people experience, like really discrimination at school, um, in every single public service, uh, public service, you mentioned hospital, for example, how does it interlink with on, uh, online violence? Are they like, is on, online violence then leading to offline violence, for example? Uh, usually when it's uh, hate against Roma people online, in uh, many cases it stays online. But there were some cases in Czech Republic um, when the online hate uh, becomes in the real world, and it was very, very rough. For example, one um, one uh, boy from uh, the town Břeclav, he was exercising, doing. He was non-Roma uh, uh, guy. He was exercising somewhere, doing some gymnastic stuff, and he injured himself very badly. So he ended up in the hospital. But before he went to the hospital, and he was scared to to tell his uh, mother about. Uh, uh, the injury, so he told his mother that three Roma uh, uh, guys beat him up, and um, so he went to the hospital. And when he woke up from uh, the surgery, uh, it was in the all of the major media that three Roma guys uh, hurt one boy. So uh, on the Facebook, on the YouTube, in the major media, it was like big rumor about it. Uh, and it ended up as a big demonstration of about 2,000 people in Břeclav, in the town Břeclav. And uh, some of the, about 200 people from that crowd, the right-wing uh, radicals, wanted to go to the um, part of the, the city when, uh, where Roma lives, and they want to confront them and they want to be them, but the police, um, uh, protect the protected the Roma people, but yeah, the, this is one of the uh, few cases that the uh, online hate uh, becomes the in the real world, in the offline world. But I think uh, my opinion is that uh, the online uh, hate is sometimes more dangerous than the offline because, it, as I said, it spreads very quickly and it. Um, uh, and it's um, um, very dangerous for people because uh, the, the hoax or the, the untrue informations are uh, very, very dangerous. Yeah. Absolutely, and it, it just continues the, the thinking and this, um, it's very pervasive as, as well. It feels like everybody thinks the same thing about Roma people. There is no counter argument being trying to shown online, so it's really hard to, to get against this narrative as well. Um, coming back to female journalists, maybe, or journalists in general, um, it, how do you explain like um, that a specific kind of gendered violence um, is exercised against a female journalists and not their male counterpart? Is there a difference and how does it, how can you explain it? Yeah, to, to give you an example, um, The Guardian made a, conducted a survey in uh, 2016 and it, they reviewed all the comments, uh, about 70 million comments that they received online. 
and looked at how it affected their writers, their contributors, and out of the 10 most uh, targeted uh, contributors, nine were women and one was a black man. Um, so to, it's just to illustrate how pervasive it, it is actually for, for women. I think uh, one of the, one, uh, of the explanation for, for this is unfortunately patriarchy. Uh, sometimes it's it's difficult to see uh, women being uh, out loud on the internet, on social media, uh, exposing some uh, various uh, serious cases of uh, corruption, of politicians, uh, uh, wrongdoings. Uh, it's it's an issue for certain people. It's an issue to um, to to read about uh, journalists that are feminists. Uh, I have the example um, a couple of months ago of a journalist who, uh, a woman journalist who, who wrote um, a critics about Tarantino's uh, film, and said that the, his latest film was sexist. Uh, to be honest, I haven't seen the film. It's true, when I read these critics, I didn't really want to see the film. Um, <laughs> but s some people took it really personally. I mean, it's freedom of speech, you know. It's uh, someone, okay, she's uh, probably a feminist journalist. She's writing uh, a comment about a film. Um, she got loads of abuse online. It's been terrible for her. Um, I, I've met her personally, so I know that it has affected her for, for a couple of months afterwards. Uh, people looked into her, her biography. Uh, they criticized uh, the work she did uh, herself. The fact that she's still uh, young in the profession as well was an issue. Um, so that's, uh, yeah. Patriarchy is, is a real trouble. That's something that we need to confront. Absolutely. I've seen the film and I know this critic and I agree with her, I think. Um, the Coming back to LGBT, um, how th there is on one side like the mechanisms that attackers use online to attack um, LGBTQ people that you explain already, you give a really good overview of all the kinds of mechanism that are being in place um, to silence people or to threaten them. Um, but on the other side, there is another actor that we sometimes forget about, like activists, uh, which are platforms themselves. We're using like very few platforms and um, they have also a huge impact on how we actually can express our freedom of expression. Um, what is it in the case of um, LGBTQI plus people? Um, how do main platforms like Facebook, Instagram, um, Grinda even, um, as you mentioned them, um, how do they impact uh, the, the life of LGBTQI plus people, but also the movement in general? Okay. Thank you. Um, I think I also forget to spoke about uh, censor in the first question because I speak about violence, discrimination, censor is also a discrimination. Um, I think uh, the LGBT movement, when I speak about LGBT movement, I mean political movement, organization, national organization and European organization, uh, they use uh, c uh, every day uh, the, the, the Facebook or uh, other uh, media. Uh, but we, ha we, we, we are also exposed to the censor, um, like other groups, but with LGBT is, uh, for example, uh, against the bodies, like uh, bodies are, when we spoke about bodies with LGBT, it's part of our culture, bodies for our, our political, like uh, a lot of intellectual are right about this, we are questioning body because in the society the authority question our body. So, if uh, we organize uh, exposition, for example, at Rainbow House, sometimes you 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 have a naked man, naked woman, or you if you speak about vulva, you use so, and uh, we have uh, usually censor uh, about Facebook, for example, more Facebook than Instagram. We can uh, not promote all our events. So this is uh, very, uh, a very critical uh, thing. And, um, but we, can, we have also to recognize that 
uh, the, for we are not like against uh, the <laughs> the this pla this kind of platform because we get also benefit uh, today uh, there is a big uh, community of youtubers uh, big uh, influence for, uh, influencer on Instagram, um, so we, it's also a, sp a space to share, to spread the information, also the experiences, because we have we are now in a new uh, uh, so society, society of sharing experience. Like young people, uh, they prefer to see a video about a trans uh, man than uh, read a book. So it's not, uh, it's a little bit caricatural, I understand, but videos are very important, so we have also benefit of this. Yeah, of course, <laughs> we all benefit from the internet. Um, that's quite interesting. Um, coming back to uh, your uh, people with uh, disabilities, um, what are what are the views of children and people with disabilities uh, on on all those problems, on all this kind of discrimination taking place online, um, and how does it impact uh, them? How does it impact their social life, their health? Um, you can imagine also in general their whole experience of being online, and how do, what are the the things they put in place to to protect themselves? Thanks. Well, um, it's very diverse, um, obviously, and um, on one hand, I'm going briefly on the, the use of the movement as well, the disability movement on, of this platform is, is obviously, a, it's obviously a tool that has been very much used. I mean, there are some hashtags which are hilarious, and at the same time, they are pushing changes in society, such as creep the vote to denounce problems in, in voting rights and exercise your, your right to vote. Disabled people are hot. Um, abled people are weird. I mean, there are some, some campaigns running, ongoing campaigns which have been used. And uh, obviously, uh, many persons with disabilities reinforce their identity through this, uh, or use this, uh, what I say, use this platform uh, as a way to also self-identification, self-determination as well. And but, and again, uh, this uh, contrasts very much with the problems that um, they face when it comes to uh, what I mentioned before, all those cases, uh, and particularly those disabilities such as intellectual or psychosocial disabilities, meaning uh, mental health uh, issues, which obviously um, made a, a cause that, uh, those, those people uh, will face um, double discrimination or more barriers to, to, to exercise their rights and, for instance, seek for remedies on how to respond to those abuses. And these people know, and in the case of, of children, for instance, there is a report from the Council of Europe um, in, in six countries, I believe, in which they had focus group with children with disabilities and in total there were 97 children and uni unanimously, what a difficult word, all of them said that they don't disclose their disability online and they don't want to disclose their disability online because they fear that this would attract abuse uh, and rejection and many of them mention also their use of assistive technologies, their special devices that they use in, in some cases as a signifier of their disability. And Everything comes to uh, ensuring that children with disabilities and people with disabilities uh, do get the support they need to first identify those cases. No, first, in this order, first, how to be safe. Then identify these cases of abuse and then being able uh, and, know, and knowing how to respond. And in cases of people with intellectual disabilities, of children, the um, the assistant that uh, the assistance that their peers, their their families, their relatives could provide them is very important. But without the knowledge on how to cope with this kind of situation, many people with disabilities are just disencouraged from using this platform, and that's not the way. No, because then the if I made it, the bad guys will win. So. Uh, 
we need more support, we need more uh, awareness on how to be safe, how to identify cases, how to respond to those. And this, we can only make it if, uh, if we finally uh, um, ensure and fight for uh, the, the, um, to, to embrace diversity in these social media as well, or in this uh, social platform. And that comes to, to education in the end, I guess. Super interesting, actually, a answer. We, we're moving slightly towards like trying to think about avenues for, for improving the experience of the different uh, people we talk uh, today. Um, I'm going to do a last round of questions before moving to the, to the public, and I will try to direct them a bit towards like solution. <laughs> um, Stefan, can you? present a bit the work you've been doing uh, with Romea on this issue of online um, experience, online violence, um, and maybe if you have like an, a Roma perspective on what the legislator could do or what companies could do, if you have uh, any idea for that. Thank you. Um, yeah, so uh, we in Romea, we are trying to uh, help Roma people in many different ways, but as you ask uh, about the um, online violence, so uh, if there is some um, case of discrimination and violence uh, uh, against Roma people, they can call us. They can, um, we can, we can uh, help them in uh, recommenda recommendation to other organizations that, for example, help them through uh, their legal advice, social advices. We used to, in the past, we used to have um, um, telephone, like um, discrimination um, uh, helpline, helpline, yeah, uh, and it's still working because uh, many of Roma people c calling us uh, about some housing problems, some schooling problems, and we are trying to um, we are trying to uh, give them a recommendation for other organizations, but also we are trying to help because most of our work is with the uh, children, especially um, high school children, Roma children who are uh, maybe discriminated in, in the school. So we are trying to help them, giving them a scholarship and helping them through uh, the studies because we think that uh, if we want to change some, uh, some uh, view on Roma people in Czech Republic, we, are tr we are have to uh, uh, do it through the young people. So I think if there will be some, in, th in the future, there will be some lawyers, uh, um, there will be teachers, and there will be Roma teachers, Roma lawyers, it maybe will change a little bit the, the mindset of the people in the majority. So um, besides the, the uh, helpline, uh, the um, the discrimination helpline we have the other programs for the for the children uh, and also um, the newest one is uh, that we are traveling around the elementary schools in Czech Republic and we are motivating the the Roma children in elementary school to go to the high school to be a, a better person to to have a better life to to show the majority that uh, there are no disabilities in, in Roma community. We can get uh, what we want if we if we trying hard. And um, the second question, um, there were many uh, differences in, uh, in um, investigating some uh, causes. So there was a, there was a, uh, for example, uh, there was a picture of uh, elementary school children and there were few of them were Roma children and it was on Facebook and there was a comment that uh, Roma, these Roma children should be uh, killed by gas like in the Second World War. So uh, this, uh, uh, this actual case was uh, um, investigated and it in ended up in a trial but there were many other that don't. So maybe my advice for the um, higher uh, authorities uh, to, to unify the system of uh, investigating all these causes because it's, 
it um, doesn't mean that it's maybe in um, inconsequential, but it is. So, yeah, to unify all the all the steps to to investigate it. That's really interesting. It's it's really like two things. It's um, not just focusing on online, but it's a broader, we're talking about broader societal problem, we're talking about patriarchy, we're talking about racism, uh, we are talking about anti justice and this is like, we need to think about like education, obviously, educational measures. Um, and the second point is also super, super good because it's, um, it's about like the prosecution of illegal hate speech online and, and how this doesn't actually work at the moment and, uh, and people fail to actually prosecute uh, those who are doing the, the bad, who are like providing uh, racist comments, uh, hurting people. Um, and this is usually left without any consequences, as you said. So it's, uh, I think it's two good points we can take on board. Um, what about, um, sorry, what about, um, I'm coming back to you, Pamela, if you have any recommendation uh, in terms of uh, countering online violence against uh, women journalists, um, some best practices. You were talking about media. It's also interesting to have a point of view, uh, like a, your viewpoint about what media themselves can do to protect their own journalists. Yes, there's many things we can do, and it's true. I, 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 I quite agree with you that uh, the main problem is impunity. It's total impunity for comments, people hiding behind uh, nicknames, which is, which is or anonym, people being anonymous. I know it's, uh, it, it's probably an important uh, issue in, in, this, uh, in this forum as well. Um, I'm not saying people should not be anonymous, but what what we're witnessing is that people on the anonymous account are, 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 are sending a lot of hatred messages and, and um, that's problematic. Uh, now, um, I think it's a problem for all of us actually. Um, what when we see, uh, in, in, uh, from our perspective as media professional, um, the effect of online harassment is that people don't dare to speak up anymore. Uh, it has a chilling effect not only on women journalists and men journalists because they get abused as well. It has effect on them, but it ha also has effect on people witnessing what's happening. It means it's di it discourages other people to, to speak up and take uh, and um, be active on social media. And, uh, and I don't think it's just the issue of, Ro of Roma people, it's not the issue of LGBT or journalists. It's everyone's problem if, uh, if social media lack diversity and pluralism. So uh, one very simple thing that could be done is that each time one sees abuse online, one reacts. Um, from our perspective as media, we're asking media organizations to take a stand and, um, and uh, protect their journalists uh, publicly. So if one journalist, because what happens very often is that the most target, the female that are most targeted are freelance journalists. The ones that don't work, that are not protected by newsrooms, that sometimes work from home uh, and have clearly uh, less protection than, than the rest of the newsroom. It's very important that the media take a stand and say that this is not acceptable, that there is a zero tolerance against online harassment and that they speak up on the social media, on the feed of the journalist that is being attacked to protect them. And it's important for us as well, witnessing this, to do the same. Because if you send a private message to a journalist or anyone else to say, look, I'm so sorry, this is so unfair, it's good for this person, but it doesn't, it doesn't give any message, it doesn't send any message to the harasser. And I'm not talking about troll, because I consider that this is harassment as much as offline harassment. It's not a troll, it's a, it's a real person who is harassing. So that's, that's the main thing. Then in the media also have to educate themselves. There's clearly a lack of gender equality education in the, in the media itself and also in, in journalism schools. So there need to be a whole, uh, um, yeah, a whole education on, on gender equality. And there's also generally a lack of uh, policy dealing with gender equality, dealing with uh, uh, online abuse, etc. online. Um, I've heard of women journalists saying that they had to convince um, moderators to take down some content because they didn't understand what a misogynist comment was. 
and it, it's not fair that you have to battle against one of your colleagues to take a comment down, a comment that is affecting you deep, deeply. Um, so that would be some of the advice to, to, to make a change. Uh, it's also touching about freedom of expression, so we have to be cautious, but there are some simple steps that can be taken. Absolutely. Um, even even this idea of um, um, this is about like also the moderator being aware uh, and 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 deconstruct a bit and understand and being able to identify the the discrimination is already a big step. And in in general, when we think about the big platforms, moderators are are, are not trained for this. They're like really far from realities, and maybe they don't even understand the language. Uh, in which the comment was posted. So it's a, it's a big issue in terms of training the person who are responsible for moderating the content. Um, regarding LGBT, do, do you have any recommendation in terms of legislation or even, I, I know maybe you, you thought about a um, good example of companies who can support LGBT in feeling better online. Um, do you have any kind of guidelines for this? I think uh, specifically for Belgium, uh, the first thing that we have to do is about number and statistic, uh, because uh, actually we don't have a good uh, representative statistic about violence uh, with uh, the LGBT uh, com against the LGBT community. For this, uh, Rainbow House is working with the regional uh, government. Uh, in the um, SOGI plan, and we we created a report card, uh, so people can come to Rainbow House to report because uh, actually the numbers are based about the numbers of uh, the police and uh, UNIA. So we know in our uh, organization, in our community, people uh, don't avoid uh, no, don't. Uh, trust the police, so they, they don't go to the police, so these numbers are not uh, very f credible. This is one thing, statistic uh, and numbers to develop a better uh, solution and response. Then uh, I think about law and rules. I think law can protect the groups, everyone. Uh, LGBT, Roma, women, uh, ev every mi minority, but laws have also positive uh, impact in the society. For example, with uh, equal uh, marriage for LGBT, uh, they give a lot of uh, hope to uh, LGBT community, but uh, also to the homophobic people, like in France uh, or in United States, we say a lot of so the numbers change, like people who were uh, homophobic change because they, they notice nothing changed, the, the world is okay, even with equal marriage, so this is positive. Um, so I think maybe uh, Idri can research uh, with all what uh, is uh, concerning the term of use, for example, if someone uh, registered to Grindr or to Instagram or YouTube, you have the, the, the first uh, term of use and we know nobody uh, read this because it's very, very long, it's kilometric, nobody understand. Uh, specifically people with my English, uh, we are like uh, too lazy to read it. So maybe we have to think about all users uh, language, uh, maybe uh, not once, because you receive the term of uh, using one time, but you can have like reminder. Uh, there are also new uh, companies, I don't want to make uh, promotion, but for example, Netflix, uh, they are, yes, you see like uh, LGBT activists, uh, the initiative to to represent all people and to have respect to the communities, specifically the LGBT community. And it's very interesting, I think, for young people. And uh, maybe one thing, uh, 
when we talk about education, we, we have also to think to old generation, specifically in the uh, north, because uh, our uh, population are uh, uh, yes, becoming old, and they use also the social media, and this is also very important. Thank you. I'm going to ask you the same question, Alejandro. Um, what are your biggest recommendations um, to counter this whole problematic? Um, and what could the legislator or the companies, it's up to you, uh, which one you want to address tonight, um, you want, you would, would, which kind of recommendation you would give them? Thanks. Well, uh, as I mentioned before, <coughs> The, the answer is not to disencourage anybody from using the platform, but to be prepared and, and to know how to, how to respond. And regarding the policy recommendations uh, and going a little bit beyond the, this, this kind of platforms, at, at the European Disability Forum last year, we published this report, which is called uh, Plug and Pray. Pray that it works for you, obviously in which we look into the, the, the opportunities and the, also the risks of uh, artificial intelligence, Internet of Things, the reality technology like AR and uh, VR and so forth for persons with disabilities. And actually one of the recommendations is precisely what we are doing today, which is like to exchange uh, information about different, different groups and build allies and synergies. Um, so again, this encouragement of using this platform is not a solution. Reinforcement of how to, how to be safe and identify cases of abuse and being able to respond. Uh, some may say that you need to invest on digital skills of persons with disabilities. That's true, that's true, but let's not put the burden on the user because we tend to say, okay, we need more digital skills, we need more digital skills, but in the end, what we also need is the platforms or the companies to make the remedy uh, mechanism, how to report a case, easy to understand and easy to use. We need the data protection agencies to, to raise awareness of, of their role and, and, and being closer to citizens. So, okay, of building these um, digital skills for uh, particularly, as you mentioned, for children, for the next generation and, and so forth, but we also need to uh, push and ensure that these platforms and the remedial mechanisms that we have in place are actually accessible for persons with disabilities and easy to understand and use. Otherwise, they, they won't make a, um, they, 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 won't, they, they won't serve, uh, they, they won't fit pur its purpose. And uh, in those cases that I mentioned before from this report from uh, Inclusion Europe on people with intellectual disabilities, most of them, they just turn to, to relatives and, and friends. And in the end, we need to provide the tailored um, uh, learning uh, materials and support to those peers and uh, the, the individuals with disabilities in our, in our case. And again, accessibility also as one of the prerequisites, otherwise um, it won't work. Yeah. <laughs> accessibility is a big Yeah, absolutely. Um, Thank you so much for everyone. Um, there is clearly some recommendation that goes out of the scope of kind of the Digital Services Act, but it's too, still good to hear them and think about how we can integrate them in our thinking. I'm going to turn to you now um, and see whether there are some questions for our panelists. Um, don't be shy. And if you can address, uh, if you want to address the whole panel or a specific person, don't hesitate. Yeah, I think I actually have one question, but to all of you. Um, in your practice, have you, uh, have, do you have any experience with mediation as a way of uh, resolving the disputes between a uh, person who was harassed or discriminated? And I'm not only referring to online uh, conflicts. And if you have any experience with mediation or any other, I don't know, alternative uh, dispute resolution methods, uh, what's your opinion? Does it work or would you rather stick to, um, because for example, you said that there, there has to be a reaction to some uh, online harassment, for example. So w what would be the proper reaction or the legal, the, the, the response of the law system? 
So if I understand correctly, it's more like the going beyond legal responses and just trying to find kind of soft mediation measures. Not really. And how does it work for you? Mediation. <laughs> Who wants to respond? Is it clear for everyone? Yeah, fair enough. I haven't heard of such experience, but there is a whole uh, education process going on. Um, the reason why there's no medi mediation is that most of the time it's difficult to, um, to identify the harassers, except when they are actually people from the profession, which is also the case sometimes. Uh, but in that case, um, the, the, the response has been pretty, pretty straightforward. I'm thinking, for example, of La Ligue du LOL. It's, um, it's a group of French journalists um, that most of them had very high positions in the media. And for many years, uh, La Ligue du LOL would, could be translated as the guilt of LOL being laugh out loud. Uh, which is exactly what it was. Um, so this group of uh, male journalists would uh, harass certain uh, freelance female journalists for years uh, uh, on many topics. And, uh, and no one said anything for many years because all of them had very high connection and were all at high level position within media. Uh, and when, when uh, the story came out last year, it was actually last February, uh, in, a news in a French newspaper, uh, many of them were, f were fired. They were first suspended and fired. But it was not what I would call mediation. But at least there was a response. Uh, mediation is complicated because, uh, yeah, most of the time, you know, th when you have this uh, mob of uh, messages, uh, it's very difficult to, to identify who, who is actually there. But I, I think it could be a solution, it's true. And actually, thinking about it, sometimes people have apologized. So there's hope. So for me, uh, the, um, the way how to maybe, did I, um, um, did I understand the question that uh, you want to know if there's a softer way how to cooperate with the, with the violence on, on the internet? Is it is it right? Is it the question good? Or is it maybe not pictured this way you wanted? Sorry. <laughs> well, okay, maybe mediation or the restorative justice approach may sound as a software approach, but it's not. Well, in in its application, it doesn't have to be soft. You have uh, you have the actor, you have the perpetrator. You confront him or her with with the uh, person harassed, uh, and you have to and. In some systems, the court refers parties to the mediation, and it's 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 a very it's very difficult because you have this inequality of of this of these parties. It's very hard to mediate, and mm -hmm. in some systems, it's uh, even considered that these uh, these are not media media table. Um, well, it, the the, the yeah. cases are not s uh, capable of being mediated, uh, so it doesn't have to be soft. Um, and it's sometimes sometimes mediation is mandatory, but the um, uh, the benefit is that uh, with the traditional approach you punish, like you said, uh, some people got fired, but this doesn't necessarily mean that they understood what they were fired for. They yeah, don't yeah. understand, maybe they don't understand um, what was the reason. They they would not agree with the with the, the with the outcome, and what mediation in the criminal law what it what it's does, I mean, not always, but what, what, it, what it can do is that uh, it may uh, help the perpetrator to understand and change their uh, behavior. Yeah, um, thank you. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> right now I understand. Um, uh, I've never experienced a uh, um, process like this uh, in, in my uh, career in Romea, but um, as I can say, uh, we have a different type of uh, um, different type of ways how to how to maybe cooperate with the with the people who did some hate on the internet. So we are trying to educate them about the history of Roma people, for example. Uh, if they're knowing uh, better the history of the people, they maybe understand the 
the whole issue. Uh, and also, um, if uh, we are trying to, uh, or maybe there's another way to uh, to spread the uh, or to to help the people understand that to um, uh, not just educate themselves, but maybe to understand the the community to to um, <laughs> share some times with the community mm -hmm. also. So uh, yeah, that's all. But I've this type of uh, uh, way I've never experienced, so I'm I'm not sure if I'm able to talk about. Talk about yeah. So yeah. Somebody wants to. I only know that um, mediation is uh, very much used um, in the U.S. Um, for accessibility cases, accessibility barriers that mm, people find online, and, and instead of taking the the company to court, they they have this remedial and mediation action. In Europe, I don't think it's very much um, in place for these purposes yet. Do we have another question? Nope. Yeah. Uh, thank you, first of all. Um, I'm not sure if it's a comment or a question, uh, because it's not yet uh, completely articulated in my thoughts, but uh, like, for example, in the Netherlands, there's a... Um, um, within education, uh, the primary education, there's like a systemic uh, forms of exclusion towards uh, uh, children of color. So from a kind of white supremacist um, patern paternalism in the sense of protecting the uh, children of color from higher education because they probably will have to struggle too much from this kind of paternalism. So I, I, I heard um, different um, comments of, uh, about education and, and, and the struggle. Uh, also in terms of the scholarships, in terms of uh, um, making pathways for mar marginalized uh, communities to um, get to resources you otherwise can, uh, can cannot. So I, 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 I maybe I, I want to have a little bit more your take on this. A topic, and I don't. Of course, I don't know how it is within your local context. So, yeah, that, that's about it. Somebody understand everything? I didn't. <laughs> there, there is a question. What it, like the question is on what is your thoughts on this program of scholarship for children? Um, no, um, no uh, wait, L let me think one second. Um, what I can suggest is that you can try to m formulate your question and yeah. then try to reach one of the panelists and ask it directly because unfortunately we are uh, yeah. ahead of our time. Okay, yeah, uh, sure. But sure. thank you very much and... So then I will formulate my uh, question. Um, you, you, you after that. Oh. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't make myself clear. I suggest you think about your question and then you grab uh, one of the panelists by the arm and try to ask uh, the question directly to her or to him. Uh, thank you so much for staying uh, so long. Uh, there is now food actually outside, I think. Sorry? Oh, yeah, there is a closing ceremony that everybody needs to attend, absolutely, because it's amazing. Um, a big round of applause for the panelists and sharing their experience and be there.